What's going on, everyone? Welcome to this week's edition of River City 93. I'm your host, as always, Elliot Barr, and is joining me are three men that are equally all excited for the three points that the Richmond Kickers earned against Lexington Soccer Club. Um, it was a pretty good week, pretty good day. Maybe not a good week because, you know, SEF's game, but we won't talk about that. We'll talk only about the Lexington game, how Jao Gamario scored another wonderful goal. And some other good stuff. So, first joining me is Mr. Matt Myers. How are you doing, sir? Doing all right. Doing all right. There we go. That's good. Um, Matt, do you want to share the story of how you got confused with uh, Jalen Chrysler? Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, just walking around you know, the concourse pregame, have my last season Jalen Chrysler jersey on. Yeah. All of a sudden here, I don't know, 10, 11-year-old kid. Chrysler, is that you behind me? Obviously, I knew he was talking to me you know, because you know, clearly I'm just as tall, just as uh, stunningly good-looking, clearly just in as good a shape you know, as a professional soccer player. Uh, unfortunately, did not think fast enough in the moment to play into it and you know just mess with the kid. So I'm taking this as you know, just a big life win of uh, – so many things that I could pass for a pro soccer player. Uh, alternate universe is it that kid? You know, right up there is you know just the going to be a next level elite trash talker. You know, <laughs> in real life, you know, be able to you know, think that uh you know a me looking dude, you know, uh, is what a professional player would have you know descended to within just a few months. <laughs> right. All that went wrong you know, out in Knoxville. That would that would happen. Um, fair question. So when he comes to Richmond, uh, Jalen Chrysler, is there any way we possibly might see you on the field replacing him? You know, if we have an injury crisis, I think that would be a great win for everybody except Knoxville. There we go. <laughs> I, I would have no shame in just you know, doing the big match machine, <laughs> you know, turning around, seeing if I could uh, you know, score some own goals before they uh, you know, figure it out or just you know, literally beat me. There we go. I appreciate that. Appreciate you taking one for the team. Of course. Um, course. (laughs) Also joining us is a guy that's enjoying his vacations, Mr. Gabe. How are you, sir? Doing good. Back from Panama City Beach. Um, Back into normal life we go. So Ah, The the shitty realization of coming back from vacation. Never get told. Uh. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's good. It It was fun. You know, cousins, grandma. It was good. It was a good visit. Watched the NCFC game, unfortunately. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah, that sucks. That sucks. <laughs> and last but not least is the guy that's all the way out and has good Wi-Fi reception tonight. It's Mr. Shanir Duran II. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. Um, I'm really I'm really a little pissed off that I missed the last recording because I, I I had some words for uh uh Mr. Luke Pavone. Um Wait until he was away from Richmond to score his first goal, so we couldn't go bananas with him. Uh, I'm a little upset about that. Come on, man, Luke. You 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 know, you know you need you need to be you need to be scoring your first goal at home. You need to be scoring your first goal at City Stadium. Right, he does. Um, I was super happy for him. <laughs> that was the first thing Ted talked to me about. Was like, oh, Luke uh, scored his first ever goal, and I'm pretty sure you woke up on it. I was like, yes, yes, I did. I felt like a proud dad. I don't oh. know how it feels to be a dad, but I felt like a proud dad. Oh, I was I was jumping I was jumping around my living room like a madman. It's <laughs> Luke. Happy for him. Um, but guys, let's go ahead. Let's dive into this week's uh game. Um, because it's a happy podcast, and I think we're excited to talk about this one. So Richmond gets a two one win over Lexington. I'm willing to count it as two nothing because that pin should have never happened, but uh, we'll talk about that point later. Let's start off talking about the lineups. Emilio Ano Terzaghi finds his way back into the starting 11. Uh, Chris Cole is still at center back. Ja- and Jao keeps his place in the center mid. 
Um, also, Carlton Belmar and Owen Gordon out on the wings. Thoughts on the starting 11, how the game started off? Yeah, I mean, it was um, – it was. I, I feel like I'm, I'm just wondering when Neil's going to come back, you know. Uh, granted, I'm, I'm very pleased with how joao has been playing, but um, – but yeah, I, I figured by now maybe Neil would be back. Maybe he had a bit of a setback or something. But um, and Dakota being out still is not a surprise if it's a if it's you know looked like a hamstring injury uh, from the Greenville game. So that's not surprising. Uh, I will say also I was glad to see Emmy back. Um, I had a theory in our group chat that maybe he wouldn't be in the lineup because he wasn't in like the day before game, like kind of hype video that they do of training. And last time he wasn't in that video, he wasn't even in the team uh, down in North Carolina. So I was like, maybe, maybe they're sending us a message without us knowing it. So, but I'm glad, I'm glad it was nothing. I'm glad I was just overthinking it. Yeah, there you go. Um, Matt, anything for you on how this game started off? Because it seemed like Lexington was taking it to Richmond in the opening minutes. I, mean, I think taking it to them is maybe a little generous uh, to Lexington there. I mean, they had more <laughs> possession, but it's not a, not terribly unusual for you know, the kicker sometimes to uh, you know use that first little bit to feel out you know the game, see mm-hmm. you know where it's going. Uh, you know, I think with the wings that Darren picked you know, for this game and uh, you know, Gordon playing primarily out on the left. Uh, you know, we saw a little bit more of uh, kind of a 2022 style, you know, attack at times with you know, just a burner out on the, you know, the left wing. And, uh, you know, I saw, saw Ollie play some of those long diagonal balls that you and Chenier, you know, love and hate simultaneously, uh, you know, so much. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think it took a little bit of you know, time to kind of you know figure out what Lexington wanted to do and then be able to react. But after that first you know fifteen minutes or so, you know, really felt like you know the things swung pretty consistently in Richmond's direction. Yeah, it just seemed like uh, it just seemed as if like Richmond just needed to once they figured out what Lexington was doing, they put their foot on the ball and kind of just slowed the game down and kind of just slowly took it over. Um, Akira. Had a reaction save, I think, around the 20th or so minute. Really good reaction save to make sure Lexi doesn't get on the board early. I think we talk about it a bunch of times, but this is something that Akira does that makes it seem like it's normal almost at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it. if Akira Fitzgerald is in the lineup, it's not a normal game if he doesn't have one of those, at least one of those. It's just – it's just part and parcel of the kickers. I mean, that and it just shows how good he is with how good our defense is. And no matter how good your defense is, they're human. I mean, this and the other team is trying to score. So it, it, you're going to have situations where they get they get turned around. They get a shot comes off. I mean, they're not going to be able to completely knock you out. They're not robots. And for Akira to have that awareness and mental sharpness, even if we've gone long spells without them really putting a lot of danger on us, for him to just pop up with a save like that just shows the level of goalkeeper he is. Yeah, it's good to have someone someone like that with that ability, you know, that can pop up and save a goal. Now, also in this game, we also had another goalkeeper, um, my national team goalkeeper, Mill Knight. Um Made another amazing save on Gordon's header um, in the first half as well. I from where we were sitting at section O, when Gordon heads it down into the ground, I was like, "Oh, this is a goal!" And then to see a Mill make that save lets me know they're probably in for a long night because it seemed like both goalkeepers were standing on their head at that point. Yeah, I actually thought it looked better on video than it did live because the angles. You know, uh, Ellie, you and I, you were at. Uh, I didn't realize just how you know far across you know the goal that that header had gotten. I thought it was, you know, one of those where I was like, oh, you know, Gordon should have been able to head it further back across the goal, but he actually did that. So uh, yeah. I mean, credit where it's due. Good save, and uh, one of those things where 
especially given how things have gone at home the last few games that happened to just like, oh, come on, this again? <laughs> We're still waiting on another goal in Section O. It's coming. It's coming soon, hopefully, in the next home game. But, yeah, I thought that was the moment. We're going to have a Section O goal and be able to celebrate and enjoy it. But it didn't happen because of great goalkeeping. Um, but another player that I was ranting and raving about in the first half was Justin Suko. Um, he made a lot of crucial tackles, a lot of tackles that turned into um, to dangerous attacking chances, man. He's really seemed to find his place in the midfield. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah Suko yeah. is yeah. – I'm glad all y'all want to talk about how great Justin Suko was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now Su- Suko – and, and it, it's interesting because there was a uh, – Something they did talk about, the commentator did talk about throughout, throughout the game, talking about how Darren, in an interview, had talked about how, with regards to how, you know, Terzaghi isn't firing like he normally does, our attack isn't as big as it, nor, as it was last season. Um, he, he equated a, he, a big portion of that to us missing Ethan Bryant and what Ethan Bryant brought to the team. Um, I think Suko is a slightly more defensive version of what Ethan Bryan brought to the team, and he's really starting to bet in well. He's starting to um to to really link up better with with the rest of the team, um, being pretty much new this season. But I think this is a sign of a different kickers team from last year, and the and I think the kickers are finally starting to accept that they are a completely different team than last year without Ethan, without uh, Johnny B we're looking, there needed to be a rebirth of sorts. And I think, I think Suko is a key part of that and his performance today, well today, but his performance in this game was very, very, very spot on. Yeah. He did a lot of that dirty connective work. Um, Usually a job that we see from Zaka, like, Going into tackles, um, you know, recoveries and whatnot. I think at one point, I think in the second half, I think I counted up to four tackles or something close to it. Like, he, he just seemed to be all over the field. And it seemed like him doing that job was, one, keeping Zaka clean because Zaka's not having to worry about being all over the field and putting out fires. But yeah, also yellow cards. Free of <laughs> yeah, like it, it was bound to happen, you know. <laughs> I'd like to um, add too that I think Suka was playing, you know, was was so physical in that game because Lexington, um, what it looked like they wanted to do was be really physical in the midfield mm-hmm. and play really tight with the rest of the midfield players. Like there was not a lot of space in the midfield, and so yeah. Suko, like as soon as Alex, like as soon as Suko lost the ball, he was quick to. Um, try to go win it back but it's part of it is lexington was just like marking our midfield midfielders very tightly yeah. throughout the game yeah it did seem like that matt did you see anything in the first half that stood out to you uh, not even different you know the first half but i think it's more just overall what he's bringing uh yeah i had some of that you know, connective passes that you guys have been talking about i think it's just his overall motor that he's mm-hmm. you know, bringing to the midfield because dude covers space uh, you know, he you know, gets up, he gets you know, back, you know, help you know, cut off counters. He is uh, you know, seemingly everywhere and doesn't seem to slow down very much, you know, as the game you know, goes on. And you know, hopefully you know, that'll continue to carry forward uh, as, you know, the season moves along and you know, uh, he, he just, he's able to you know, keep going because I think having that uh, just motor, having that you know, industry in there and you know, somebody who can, you know, kind of be that pivot between you know, the defense and the attack between the left side and the right side to free up. That'll help to free up, you know, not only Yuzaki, but also, you know, Neil or Zhao or whoever might be in more of the attacking position to be able to do a little bit, you know, more creative stuff up that way. Because I don't necessarily think that's Suko's bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Um, another guy, Matt, I wanted to bring up your boy, Mr. Uh, Simon Fitch, as I like to call him. <laughs> I just love the way how you rolled your eyes when I said that. Um, he had an, I, I'm not going to lie. He had an amazing game. Um, really just seems to be getting up and down the field on that right-handed side from the right-back spot. 
Also, seemed to get a little bit better with his uh, crosses. So that's a good thing that you like to see. Yeah, it's, it's gradually getting there. I mean, he had the uh, assist on Wednesday, uh, and it looks like he's getting a little bit more and more comfortable. I, I feel like every game, if you watch closely enough, you'll see him, you know, if he collects the ball like a third of the way into you know our offensive half, He'll collect the ball and really kind of you know take a nice driving dribble uh you know towards the middle. Uh mm -hmm. and kind of you know, do one or two guys and and I mean it's not gonna immediately lead to a goal ever, but it helps to you know uh you know switch the sides, you know, be able to you know unsettle the defense and you know open up a pass to be able to find Suko, be able to find whichever winger's playing left wing at that time. Uh so I think that's you know a nice little signature you know, kind of piece that he's being able to bring to the attack right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that seems good. But let's go ahead. Let's move on over to the second half. Um, second half, we had Alexi the chance in the 52nd minute. And once again, just go back to the uh, both goalkeepers stunning in the head. Because I really think Akira influenced um, – what's his name? Dwayf, uh the Lexington striker, into missing this goal wide to the right. Which I don't see how you're that close on goal and you miss it that wide. I don't mind. Yeah, it, I, I'm just saying. Yeah, well, I mean, we've seen we've seen outrageous stuff. I mean, I, I've seen some of the world's greatest players miss sitters, like literally right in front of an open goal. It, it it happens, but I do think you have a point in that just Akira's presence, his positioning forces the attacker to aim for the corner, to aim wide uh, in order to get a chance to score. And when you aim wide, you might go too wide. So, um, yeah, uh, a lot of times, sometimes a goalkeeper doesn't even have to touch the ball to affect the play. Um, that's a situation where that could have been the case. I think that's yeah. a little generous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. I, I'm not. I'm not gonna gonna try and read uh, Duke's mind in that situation. I don't know what he saw. What um, what he, he saw. What, he saw you know, Billy what, go standing in goal, and he said, and he was like, "Ah, oh, I'm not gonna make this." That's what he saw. <laughs> what, I, what I think actually happened was that you know, Duke got. A step ahead of where he really wanted or needed to be, he tries to you know, uh, slow down, you know, swing his hips back, and he's not able to get all the way around on the ball. I, I think we're, we're being overly kind, saying, "Oh, Akira's positioning threw him off." Uh, I, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just, I have no other way how they explained how he missed it. My take is that his run, his run was off. He was he was right in front of him. Run was off. The ball was a little behind him. <laughs> yeah. The ball, yeah, the ball was a little behind him, but I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to build. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I, wasn't exactly. here, yeah. like, I was checking to see if Ani or anyone, uh, you know, been able to give him a little bit of a bump. Nope, wasn't that. It was, yeah, you know, the ball just timing half a foot behind him. Of the run. Yeah. Well, luckily he did miss because that means Richmond gets to get in the ball first and the 60th minute with uh, Colton Belmar. Slamming in a, um, uh, I guess you call it back post uh, cross. But I want to say, I, I really want to talk about this goal for a moment. So I hope you guys indulge me because the work rate on this goal was, I think, everything Darren wants and more. Because now that you have Belmar provide the back hill pass for Suko, it's really Suko who sets up this whole goal because Suko doesn't run after the ball and chases down. Um, this chance does not happen. Ball goes out wide to what? Who was that out wide? I'm trying to remember numbers now. Was it Finch? No. Oh wait. Who's out wide? Oh wait. Okay, my fault. Oh wait. I was confused in the first and second goal. My fault. Yes. Oh wait. Drives it across the goal to Belmar. Um. Once again, man, just a Suko. Right place, right time. But Belmar scoring his first goal in City Stadium. Um. Got to be really nice for him, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a – the. Um, I remember commenting on Justin Suko winning the ball back to kick it out to uh, Owain and saying saying to, like, the group of people I was with, I was like, oh, what an effort. Like, he 
He didn't give up on the play. He found Owain. Um, Owain also had Ani to pass the ball to. Ani made a run in the box. Um, but Owain knew where Carlton would be the whole time, where KB would be. And um, and found him and just like it was a great pass. It was a perfect, you know, um, you know, went went by a few Lexington players and Carlton just slotted it home, man. It was fantastic. Yeah, and I think really to be able to I think accurately tell the story of the goal, you have to rewind it another ten or twenty seconds. Because mm-hmm. you know, that ball starts uh, I think it was with it's either Ani or Simon, uh, you know, back at the center line pinging that long ball over the top to the left, right? And uh, Suko is the one who's actually out there. You know, he'd be able to head it down. Him and, you know, Belmar, you know, worked – they try to play a little one-two game. You right the and then sniffs it out a little bit. But like you said, Suko then you know, kind of, you know, keeps his run going because if it had gone the way they wanted to initially, Suko would have been able to get a shot out from, like, you know, 10 yards. Uh, but it didn't work, you know, out that quite right there. But, you know, kept their play going and Belmar, you know, to his credit, doesn't, you know, stop the play once, you know, his pass goes a little bit awry. He recycles his run, you know, because he sees where, you know, the play is going as uh, Owen gets it out wide and puts himself in a position to kind of just dunk it home from the top of the six on the, on the back post. I mean, going back to what you were saying at first, Elliot, I don't know what you would call it other than a, a back post cross. I mean, that's <laughs> literally exactly what it was. Well, I was I was trying to remember the position. I was like, all right, was it back post or was it near post? And I'm like, oh, no, it was back post. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. that was definitely right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was back post. Late, a late run in at the back post, but a back post nonetheless. And I, I like, I really, really liked his run coming in. And it, it, it those types of runs are just so, so difficult to defend because of how late he's coming into the box with all the mayhem going on already in there. And all of a sudden, there's someone who wasn't accounted for coming into the box. It makes it so hard. Matt, I also, um, oh, my fault. You go ahead, Gabe. I would just want to add, too, that um, having somebody like – this is where having somebody like Terzaghi in the box like actually matters a ton. Um, even though he didn't really affect the play that much, he he was present. And so I don't know how many sport like Sporting Lexington fans were, were on him. Um but it, it left space for KB to come in and, and make that run because, you know, if you see Emmy like in the middle of the box, like around the six yard box, he's always at least like double covered. I mean, there's a chance in the first half where um, Simon found him, but he was, he had three Lexington defenders on him. And so like Emmy actually like, being triple covered and double covered in the box like this helps out like other guys to be able to run in late and, um, and, and put it home. Yeah. Yeah. And if you watch the highlight back, literally the second that Gordon gets it, Belmar's already calling for it. Cause he knows, you know, he sees that if he's open, he's you know, a few yards behind uh, whatever Lexington defender, doesn't matter who he was, uh, you know, at the back post, but he already sees the run that he's going to make. Mm-hmm. And Matt, listen to the interviews that you provided us, which I appreciate you, sir, for doing. Uh, um, it seemed like from Coach's interview, this is something like they have been working on consistently. And now is it really the big thing I took away from Coach's interview was about how this is something Darren's been drilling at them to work on and and, and to have them, you know, use in game, right? Yeah, even after the last uh, you know, home game, which was you know, on that string of zero zeros at home, you know, Darren you know, was feeling good about most of what the team is doing is just that you know final service you know, coming through. Uh, and I think this is a lot of what we've seen you know over the years. You know, Darren likes you know, to be able to you know, have the ball you know come wide and you know, get you know across in you near know, the box, whether that's you know Emmy, whether that's you know Neil, you know whoever it is, you know kind of. You know, crashing in there, you know, you know, Bologna's on the back post, Bentley, Boldick, some, you know, times, you know, early in the Darren era, you know, to be able to you know, not necessarily always, you know, kind of a you know, dunk scenario like, you know, Belmar had today, but getting those easier chances if the service, you know, you know comes in and plays out, you know, quite right. So I do think there's something to that. And you saw it in you know, some of the other goals, you know, the last few games as well. Yeah. And I mean, even 
on the second goal, we kind of saw the same thing, Matt, that you were alluding to earlier. I mean, I game that you were alluding to about how defenders are kind of following Emmy and whatnot because, <laughs> Matt, I need you to tweet more about how uh, Darren subs don't usually work out because they seem to, and we get goals from them. Well, um, which... that, that's not what I said. <laughs> I, I said this is a defensive sub. You're taking out uh, – who did he take out? That must have been when Delmar got hurt. Yeah. Right, and he you know, puts in uh, Meacham because I think all of us probably you know, would have guessed that, okay, Belmar's coming out, it's going to be Bentley, maybe Luke. Yeah. Right, not our you know, utility outside back. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until you said that it was me. I just looked at it and just assumed it was Luke. So that's more on me. Uh, so with that, but, yeah, Jake gets a uh, nice assist. And when I – but get, um, gave your point – and he kind of makes that same run again, even though he had really – I mean, he didn't do anything that shows up on the stat sheet. Like, his presence alone drags the Lexington and what opens up some space for Jow to put it back post again. Yeah, and Jow's finish on that on that goal was perfect. I mean, he really couldn't have placed it any better, you know, right like right into the side netting. Um, and the, the run, he – Jow's – He's sneaky fast. Like I don't know if you guys have noticed, he's he's quick, and so like the the run he had coming in was he he was moving fast, and um, the ball was perfect as well. Like just just found him right in the right spot. Um, now in this scenario, Emmy wasn't particularly like covered as well in the box. Like if you look at the highlight, like if if it goes off a post or if like a if Knight saves it, um, I think Emmy's there for the rebound. Uh, but you know him being in the box already does drive those defenders away from Joao, so Joao can make that that late run. Yeah, Chanel, let me ask you this question, man. Jake Meacham, he's been really impressive so far. Why? Why has he been one of the signings thus far that's, I guess, made his impact work so well in this Richmond squad? Um. Well, Meacham. There, there is an element that he does bring to uh, to the attack and the defense at the same time is just there's a certain level level of energy that he brings with composure, and a lot of times you don't get that combination in players. You don't get you, the really composed ones are the ones that are going to do the least amount of running. They're going to try to strategize and and not be as aggressive, and the ones that are have all the energy and are, you know, running all over the field, a lot of times tend to be the ones that don't have the composure in the heat of the moment. He brings both of those together and through his development, I think he, he's just, he's turning out to sharpen up to be a really, really good defensive and offensive player. Just someone who can, can provide you that composure while still harrying the other team when they're moving the ball through the midfield making those runs around, which is a, a, another reason why I think Darren subbed him on because you're bringing that energy in late in the game when there are tired legs and you bring in this, this guy who's got a lot of energy, but still a lot of clarity to see exactly what's going on around the field. So that that's a very big element coming off the bench. And I think over time, he might be able to work himself into the first team with that who he would bump off. Not sure. Um, but he definitely does bring a very valuable element coming off the bench. Yeah, yeah it does. Um, so two 0 up, things seem to be going well right until the end of the game, where we get to what the ninety second minute with the uh, penalty that I don't think is a penalty. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about how it should have been three nothing first, or do you want to? I was going to come back to that. Um, but yeah, we can go ahead and talk about it. it was supposed to be three nothing already up with uh you talk about Bentley chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, should have been three nothing up. Um Matt Bentley. Um look, I made a note on Twitter. He's been performing really well. And this is before uh the Null Adams was announced. I would have been perfectly fine with him playing today's game. He's played really well um in that kind of number nine role so far. Had a chance one on one with well, really two v one with the goalkeeper because Emmy's right there, also open as well. Yeah, would have liked them to see him finish that chance, you know. Yeah, um, uh, it 
it, that situation, it could have been 3 0. But I, I don't know. But for me, it looked like both him and Emmy were offside when the ball was played. Like, it looked like they were at least three yards. Both of them were level with each other three yards beyond the back line. It, that's what it looked like to me. And I, I kept replaying it over like, what the? No flag, no nothing. And I, I don't know if maybe he was kind of shocked that uh, uh, no flag, okay, and it caught, may have flustered him. I don't know. But it, to me, it looked like he was way outside. I'm not going to let him off that easy. No, I, at the end of the day, he should be finishing a chance like that. That that should be, you know, or at least if, putting it to the back post to Emmy, like yeah, squaring it off to Emmy. So yeah, I'm, just saying. I'm not gonna get. Yeah, in my uh, opinion, I think I think that would have been the, the the better option, um, just simply because of the angle and where Knight was positioned. It it would just be a lot easier to just lay that ball off over to, to, to Emmy and let him have a, a, a FIFA goal tap in. Yeah. Well you gotta finish that off with uh, conviction at that point. If you're good if you're gonna take that chance, you gotta finish that. You know, right there. Yeah. Oh uh, Gabe, I saw you Naughty had anything you wanna add, my man? Yeah, I just think that like it's te- it's always tempting for you know, Matt like we were talking about it last time I was on. Now Matt is a target striker it's in his nature to want to score goals like that's just that's just who he is so i don't blame him for taking the chance i would have you know i would have wanted to do the same thing um i mean i'm no i'm no pro soccer player by any means (laughs) but but, i mean it i do think like you know you like matt taking that chance it's probably like a six out of ten he scores it laying it off to emmy like nine out of ten times that goes in you know so it's like a sure thing goal but again, like, who can blame him for taking the shot? No, I don't. Yeah, I'm not blaming him at all. It's just if you're yeah. gonna take that, yeah, I, you gotta finish. I want you to take it with some confidence. Like, put your foot yeah. through it, and you yeah, know, it, at least have to hit the yeah. have to hit, hit the target at the very least, right? You can't yeah outright miss if you're not laying it off. Yeah, that's the thing. You gotta at least hit the target or force the goalkeeper to hard save. That's it. Every then that. But moving on from that, um. Let's talk about but, this. Uh, uh, huh? there, was just, uh, there was just one thing I did. I don't know how comfortable Matt is with his weak foot, but I feel like if he had gone with his left foot, he would have been able to curl that around Knight into the post rather than the curl being going away from the goal. The, if, the curl on, if the curve on the ball is going inward, he could get that around Knight and have it curl in that far post, but the right foot is very hard to do that unless you're hitting it with the outside of the ball and hitting a Travella, which is difficult. Um, that's yeah, not. <laughs> if he's doing that in that situation, there's no reason why that man should be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but let's talk about the moment that ruined the clean sheet that Akira rightfully deserved. Uh, 90 second minute, um, Nico Brown, who was getting in some trouble around uh, on the field for some antics. Uh, pretty nasty shove there on Nathan Ani. Um, dives his way into a penalty. Um, I'm changing Lexington's name into the Lexington Swim Club because that's how they earned their goal in this game. Um, guys, yeah, what do you guys think? Do you think Jao fouled him, or no. think Nico kind of embellished it? No, um, I, I I feel that there is contact there, but I do feel that it was looked for. And I do think um, who, who was the foul called on? It was uh, I was called on Zhao. Yeah, uh, Zhao is actually not. He, he's kind of pulling back from it, and the Lexington player literally just gets the ball past him and sticks his foot out to get contact with Zhao in order to fall over, which they have started to crack down on in other leagues and I feel that USL League One needs to make sure that these referees crack down on that too because it's one thing to expect the contact and allow it to happen in order to get a penalty kick but to stick your leg out in order to get the contact to go down uh, 
we we gotta be we gotta be giving yellow cards for diving for that. Whether well, there's contact or not, they're looking for it. I don't even think it's bad. I think you know the big thing for me was Zhao clearly poked the ball away. Like you watch the replay and the ball, you know, clearly is going in a different direction because it started you know, off with you know, them getting down near the end line and taking a super low percentage shot that Akira uh, was able to just you know, push away. The you know, ball kind of bounces out. Uh, Brown is dribbling backwards in the area, and Zhao's there, and you know, he's, he, yes, sticks his leg out at that point, but he clearly toe pokes it towards the end line. You know, then, and then uh, Brown goes over his leg at that point. You know, so... Maybe on the absolute letter of the law, it could be a you know a foul, uh, but it's hard for me to accept that. You know, given the very similar calls that we've seen the kickers uh, not get earlier in this year, I think you know Bentley over in that same exact corner of the you know, penalty area, and I can't remember which one of the games it was, but there was one of them you know where he did not get you know a call that you know I thought was more egregious than that one. You know, so you know I'm fine if. You want to you know, be able to call that stuff, but I, I'd like to see you know, our guys you know, get that benefit of the doubt at times too. Yeah, um, who was it? Uh, one of the guys who does the New Dogma magazine for Foreign Matters and put a chart out um, about uh, penalty saves in USL League One. And it just, I mean, if you put it out there, we'll, we'll retweet it. But it's pretty much an interesting look and to see how who's getting the most penalties right now. I think there's been what 18 PKs in USL league one and 10 of them have been converted, which is pretty low um, to the other data he was providing. So very low. Yeah. Um, nothing really to say about the penalty save because to me, penalty kicks are usually uh, they're high up. They're like what eight, nine percent. I think on XG alone, like if you score a goal from a penalty, it's like, one point something like they're very high chances. Well, it can't be one point anything because that would mean you're expecting more than one goal off a penalty. Oh well, yeah, one. My fault. I, I think it's like point seven or something like that. Yeah, I mean, there you go. Akira, Akira got his hands to it, and it looked like he, it looked like he almost fell on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was. You never expect a save, you know. He, he guessed the right way, which is kind of all you can hope for and then there's a little bit of luck involved after that yeah uh i think what if i can remember correctly i think akira has faced maybe five pks in this time of us only one it has I don't to think be more said, than that i don't know it might be i i'm just i'm i'll look it up that'll be a project for me this week and i'll get back to you on that um <laughs> Um, final thoughts of the game. We also heard from Darren at the end of the game. Um, he seemed very emphatic about speaking about some of the noise they've been hearing. Um, and, you know, he gets to see the fruits of his fruition out there on the field of seeing the attack come together and everything like that. And it seems as if, like, once Neil come back, they're expecting a little bit more out of the midfield. And thoughts on right now on the midfield by itself because it seemed like Justin and uh, Jow have really grown into their respective spots and are really helping out a lot. Yeah, they're holding it down. I mean, they've looked they've looked really good. Um, part of me doesn't really want Joel to come out because he's like just finding himself in those those right spaces frequently. But I do think Neil coming back will affect like the way that we dictate games going forward. And I don't think Joel's quite there yet. Um, cause when Neil is there and when Neil's on, he dictates the game, you know, the game moves as Neil moves. And so, um, and I don't think Joe out draws a very, very good player and he's going to be a massive impact sub for us. Um, when Neil comes back, but I, you know, I, they, they've done great. I, I really have no complaints about the midfield. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was saying that I think this midfield has really gelled together well. Um, Zhao and Neil are two completely different types of number 10. Um, Zhao relies a lot on his quickness and speed. Neil relies a lot on his technical ability. 
um, which which gives you a different look in the attack, which I think is very, very important. Not only that, we're starting to see that there isn't much of a drop-off in terms of quality between Neil and Zhao. It's just it's a lateral difference. And that gives Darren more options and also allows both Neil and Zhao not to be overworked this season. Um, it gives them moments of rest. It gives them opportunities to, um, to, to take a break if they need to in order to recharge. And we're not going to end the season with a knackered number 10 because all Darren needs to do is tweak his game a little. If Neil needs a rest, tweak the game a little, allow for a pacier number 10 to allow for a pacier number 10, and away we go. Yeah, yeah I mean – I think we're still one player short in the midfield to really feel good. Yeah, I think the yeah. current starting three, uh, you know, is good to go. I think you know Neil, whenever you know, he returns, and every game that he doesn't return makes me wonder how much longer it actually really is going to be. Uh, but yeah, I think we have defensive depth because you know we talked about Meacham today. You know, Cole has stepped in well on the back line in Dakota's absence. Who do you, you know? If, of our current you know, midfield starters, and again, let's pretend that uh, you know, Neil isn't available. How many of them are you super confident, uh, you know, coming in and replacing one of you know Justin, Zaka, or Joel right now? Uh, super confident. Uh-huh. If worst comes to worst, say if Zaka goes down, I'm assuming. I'm assuming Chandler comes in for him in that spot. But I've, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. We've only really seen him in Zaka's spot in what, like mop up duty, right? Yeah, yeah. He's played a little bit in some of the other. Like, yeah, I think he probably technically came in for Jao a couple times. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he would be the other one, but I mean, you're, once again, Matt, you're right. <laughs> um, that's we paid a big bucks for you to be on this show. Um. Yeah, it, the midfield's pretty thin. Outside of that, now, you know. Yeah, I mean, it looks like he's trying to. Looks like Darren's trying to turn Olsen into a, you know, kind of attacking midfield sub because that's where he seems to keep coming on. Uh, but I, I think that's you know the question mark. You know, is if we get any more injuries there, what's the solution? I mean, it possibly is changing the formation. You will have to change the formation at that point, then. Just how thin the midfield is, you, you you have to, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think the next man up would be uh, our man Gabe Cox, academy, you know, signing. Yeah, he's I don't think he's touched the field yet this year, has he? I don't, I don't no, think that's the guy who hasn't made the bench yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, we don't really have a lot of central midfielders, and that's, that's why I'm really glad that that Zhao has gotten a chance to kind of get bedded in and, and to really, really, really develop and turn into a very key uh, second number 10, like someone coming off the bench. Where, and and I, we, we see this all around the world with soccer. Like, you, you can have a fantastic starting 11. They'll win you a few games. That's fantastic. You can have the best starting 11 in the world. But if you're the, the difference between your starting 11, if the drop off between the starting 11 and your bench is too big, you can't survive a season. And which is, which is very important in this situation. We're looking at at least one position where there really isn't much of a drop off between the two, the two players with Neil and Zhao. You know, we're looking at just two different types of players, but the drop off is not that big. You're not looking at, all right, if we take off Neil and put in Zhao, like, the team is going to be that much worse. Um, you're looking at a situation, the team is just going to be different. Yeah. Question for y'all real quick before we go ahead and t- go into our preview of Tormenta. Um, and we don't got to spend a lot of time on it, but Neil comes back. Um, do you put Jow out on the right wing? Right mid spot? Because we've talked about how it's kind of like a little open hole. Do you put him out there and see what he can do from out there? Or do you use him only as like, Impacts up, uh, you know that 60th minute sub. Are you saying in Suko's spot? Or are you calling that? The right I mean, my fault. That's Suko. 
God. I've talk, I've I've looked at Jao and I said to go, Jao. I knew I was gonna do it. I was trying to avoid it. No, no, you said no, you said Jao, but I was confused because I wouldn't say we play with the right mid. Oh, right winger. Do you put him out there? Uh, they don't play well. We're like we're Belmar uh, playing? No. No, I think we'd I'd, I'd rather have Belmar out there. Well, hold on. I suppose I suppose what Elliot might be getting at is having Belmar on the left. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Which is where he's been is playing, it? and then put Joel on the right. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Gabe. I appreciate you for fixing up my dream. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I understand what you're getting at. I mean, I I don't hate that idea, um, but you know, it's just hard to hard to picture it. Um, what, what does that give us though? Because I mean, yeah. Jav's good in the middle of the field. We haven't really seen him do anything out wide. And why would you take your know, one reliable central midfield sub in this scenario and put him on the field from the start out wide? I mean, we saw what happened when Chandler went out wide in Greenville game. That was a disaster. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, fair enough. I mean, I was just thinking, like, you know, based on Jav's good form, you know, keeping him in the starting 11. You know, so I mean, he's scoring good. goals. So. Yeah. I part of me can see it because like when you're scoring goals and when you're in when you're in a run of good form like if you can if you can find the field somehow like cuz he could make that same late arriving run from the wing you know and you could you could move somebody else into that position on like a build up or something so like yeah, it's, it's I, I don't I don't hate making that. that pass into the middle then cuz that's supposed to be shallow spot if he's on the wing that's what I was saying. The Neil came Simon. back. Simon can make that pass. He's been he's been playing a lot better out on the up front on the attack. Yeah, I, I just don't think. Yeah, you, you don't want to rely too much on. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to rely. You don't want to rely too much on Simon, uh, because you rely too much on him, you start to take away from his defensive duties. Yeah. And I think that's more important with that back four being. As solid as they are, you, you want him to understand that the priority is just the defensive side of things. When we're attacking, yes, get involved, overlap. Um, but we shouldn't have to rely on his crosses on that side because there could be situations where he may look at the field and be like, no, I'm not going to overlap. No, I'm not going to step up because this is a situation where I need to sit back to make sure to shore things up defensively. Someone's out of position or there's an overload or whatever. He needs to be able to have the freedom to be like, all right, no, I'm sitting back for this one. You guys go attack. Um, I, I just feel that at least to start off, I think we need to have Neil be the one coming off the bench to start off with, get him back in. We yeah. see what difference that brings because then, then you can compare side by side and see what we're dealing with. But at the end of the day, based on the skill level and what they bring, I would start Neil and just consistently, almost every game, sub Zhao on to bring that energy to run at defenses, to run at tired legs, to, to, to make a nuisance of himself in the attack um, later on in the game. Because Neil is more of a composed face-to-face, -face, you know, type of player he doesn't have a lot of pace but he has a lot of technical ability later on in the game it's not time for that anymore now it's time to go at the you you've been battering at this team this whole game now it's time to go at them hard take off Neil give him some rest put on Zhao have Zhao run at them just unleash the beat and I, I think that would work out best I still look at DeVos, the podcast, and the chaos, which I tend to do. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a cool thought experiment, you know. Um, so, I mean, listeners, let us know what you think. Um, tweet us your thoughts of how does Darren work out the Neil, Neil and Jow scenario. If it's, it's probably not a scenario, we're just making shit up. Um, <laughs> Going ahead, um, Richmond right now sits fourth in the table um, based on results that's finished up. Uh, based on the rest of the week. So we're going to find ourselves back into the top four. Um, next up, we have Tormenta, who is right now in a bad run of form. Um, just come off an ugly gloss to Central Valley Fuego. 
So Richmond goes back to Tormenta looking for three points and um, hopefully another uh, three-goal performance. Guys, what do you guys think? What are the keys to bring home three points to City Stadium? Um, much of the same, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I remember the, the last game we played against them. Um, it was pretty comprehensive. Um, 3-1 win. Um, I, I think if we can bring that same composure and that same level of energy, that same intensity to that game, I think we have a chance of just repeating that same type of performance and hopefully repeating that same result. Gabe, any thoughts for you, Matt? Any thoughts for you? Matt, I keep looking at your picture and I I keep forgetting that you're frozen and it's creeping me out because I keep thinking that you're about to say something. I'll go ahead. I I particularly remember in that last game that, um, that Hornsby looked really good uh attacking from that left uh that left fullback spot he was the one that found suko i believe in, around the penalty area played that played that same ball that we're probably going to just keep, keep seeing all season long um and uh the build up on that play in particular was was really great so i'm looking forward to seeing how um either how tormenta attempts to um, you know, maybe overload that side or like defend the left side better <laughs> uh, this time around, or if they're ready for it this time, or if we see Hornsby um, and an improved, in my opinion, very well improved Simon Fitch on in that right uh, fullback spot in the attack. If he can, if he can put some balls in the penalty area that that looked pretty dangerous. So, yeah, for me, I, I don't have any belief in tormentous defense. So. I- I'm confident our guys will be able to get their chances. Uh, I think you got to just watch out. They have a lot of you know, really quick uh, attacking wings. So just making sure that the defense is staying disciplined, not you know, kind of a giving up those you know, fouls near the penalty area, uh, but b just you know, not letting them get in behind. You know, staying uh, you know in shape and everything. If, if they hit another, you know, also not passing the ball right to them in our own third like last time down there. But you know, if they hit another goal like that fine, they can have it, but uh, as has been a theme a lot this year, not beating ourselves in terms of giving up a goal. Rightfully so. Um, I think the best way how to wrap up today's podcast is, Matt, let's go ahead and do our top threes based on to, uh, well, yesterday's game. Um, so I'll leave it over to you, buddy. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Anybody want to start us off here? i glad gladly will. Um, right. So my three points, I'll give to Justin Suko. Uh Two points I'll give to Belmar, and one point I will give to um, – one I will give to Simon Fitch. All right, all right. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I think I'm going to give my three points as well to Justin. Uh, three points to Justin. Fantastic performance. Just solid in the midfield. Um, he did all the dirty work. He did all the thankless work. He was a he was a silent hero in this one. Um, my two points, I'm going to give to uh, Fitz. He has. Uh, I mean, you pointed it out in our in our WhatsApp group, Gabe. Just he has improved in the attack. He's starting to really develop in terms of a forward-moving fullback. Um, and this game really showed that level of, of, of improvement. Um, at one point, I'm going to give it to Zhao. He made a nuisance of himself with his pace and his energy in the midfield. Um, so that's going to be my one point will be to Zhao. Yeah, um, I'm going to go... I Actually, I think I'm going to do the exact same as you, Shanir. Three to Suko, uh, two to Simon, who I was just super impressed with yesterday. Oh, he just looked so much more comfortable up near the 18 yard box. He looked, he was making, he wasn't hesitating on making runs like he had been. Like he just, he looked great. Um, and then one to Joel. All right. And 
A uh, little similar. I'm going to break up the full Suko train. I had him as my two, uh, but I actually went Owain for my three because I felt like everything good that was happening through the majority of the game was connected to him in one way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, whether that's you know getting the assist on the first one, you know, almost scoring, you know, that header in the first half, just the way he was able to stretch. You know, the Lexington you know, defense I thought was really helpful, really useful. He was, uh, you know, doing a good job of you know, getting back, grinding on defense as well. So uh, I liked what I saw out of you know Owain, uh, especially starting out there on the left. You know, for this game, I would be very happy to see him get another run out there against Tormenta. Uh, like I said, I went uh, Suka for my two, and I went with uh, you know Zhao for the one. All right, it's not bad, not bad way to round it up. Um. Guys, I think this is a good place to lead this podcast. I like doing a podcast once again after we win because they all result in a happy podcast, which are great for me. I don't have to rant. <laughs> um, but, y'all, any last thoughts before we all wrap up the show? I was yeah, going yeah. to add another another solid fan showing, 5,200 fans at City Stadium. Oh, yeah. Gotta, like, we just got to keep that up. I mean – I think we went 6,000, 5,500, 5,200. I could see us probably settling around like 47, 48, like as the summer months come. But um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really impressed with, with how fans are showing up and I really hope people keep it up. Yeah, I think it might, even, yeah. I think you might get a six in there during the summer. The way how these crowds are going. I hope so. Yeah. I just think we might average yeah, I- seven. Yeah, yeah, I, d- I definitely want to second that because um, that I unfortunately wasn't able to to go to the game. I had like a, I was driving all over Richmond and I had two games to coach yesterday. Um, on on the broadcast on ESPN Plus, City Stadium sounded good. Um, the commentator several times throughout the game was alluding to how. The the support for the Richmond Tigers is one of the biggest in USL League One. Um, we 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 come big, we come strong, we come loud, and 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 I think I think we need to keep it up, keep it up, keep City Stadium loud, keep it a fortress, keep it keep it somewhere where other teams do not want to come. Yeah, yeah, I mean, echo what you guys said, uh, but also you know, I mean, kind of shout out to just the team ops. And everything, uh, because you know, even the concourse experience is getting better. They got more food trucks in. They've got some on, you know, the other side, you know, uh, you know now too. So it's not everybody's just crowded into one spot. I think that you know, helps to spread you know, things out a bit more, make it a lot more you know, palatable. Uh, you know, a lot of credit you know to you know Camp Rob, you know the whole crew, you know that makes that you know, game day you know experience you know for everybody you know something they want to come back to. Uh, another thing I want to say is, you know, do we think it's any coincidence that you know, the team won this game, you know, and that peer pressure clearly works because we bullied, you know, Mr. Elliot Barr into, you know, showing up in section O, you know, and he was, you know, talking all about, oh, you know, should I sit in the, in the press box or should I sit with the fans this game? And look at this man, man is among the people and <laughs> you're rewarded with goals at home and three points. So, you know what you got to do moving forward here. Yeah, until we lose, and I go back into my hole. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> Move back to my press box. You know, go back to my hole. I, I'm very superstitious, so I'll stay in section though until we win, and then we lose. I'm going back, and then we win. I'll come back. You know, that's how it works. I pretty much just move up and down. There you go. Um. But yeah, listeners, we just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your day for listening to our show, because without you, we couldn't do this. So for Gabe, first and air, for Matt, and myself, we will holler at you guys next week. Um, where hopefully we'll be talking about another three points by the rules and another great performance by Joe. But until next time, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. <laughs>